Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Jim Butler with Vidiri Wealth Management and my co-host tonight is Michael Carwick of Simone Zajac Wealth Management. Hi Michael. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Well, we have uh, a great guest tonight and uh, we'll uh, be able to move to that conversation soon enough. Initially, uh, let's talk a little bit about collaboration uh, within professional services as we work with clients. So another way to say that is uh, when uh, a client uh, needs professional services related to financial services, legal, tax, uh, insurance, and so on, uh, there's any number of ways that we can help provide that service, but we don't wear all hats. Uh, what is your experience working with other professionals in helping clients to address uh, the situation that they're faced with? You know, Jim, what I'm seeing more and more is that collaboration is becoming more and more important maybe as the world gets more complex, uh, the tax codes aren't getting any simpler, estate taxes change a lot but certainly aren't getting any simpler. So as all these changes go on in the world, I think making sure Again, the core group, tend, we tend to talk about the a CPA, uh, an estate planning attorney perhaps, an investment or a financial services professional, mm -hmm. making sure that they're talking to each other because all of those areas impact each other. And we're learning more and more that what you're doing in your financial plan, certainly your accountant might want to know about. And what assets you have and how things are titled, your estate planning attorney might want to know about. So I think it's really just growing in awareness with everybody that, that the professionals start talking to each other is becoming more and more important. And so as my career has gone on in 20 plus years, we won't count exactly how long that is, mm -hmm. uh, is I'm just seeing more and more desire out there to be communicated with from those other professionals. You know, as myself, as the financial person in the team, the CPAs and attorneys are asking us more and more to just make sure they're in the loop on things. Well, how would you convey to either a, an existing client or a new client uh, the benefit of having a collaborative approach versus I'm just going to use my accountant. They're going to solve more than 50% of my problems, and I'll deal with the rest on my own. How would you address somebody taking that approach? I think the simplest way is when they sit down to do taxes, and their their accountant starts telling them that you know reviewing what the taxable items were for the past year and how they might be able to strategize to reduce taxes in the future. Mm -hmm. They're going to see how many of those items are items that we help them with as well. So there is some overlap here. For example, how much money did they take out of qualified accounts, IRAs and 401ks and things like that? Right. When did they start taking Social Security? You know, if they did that while they were still working, did some of the Social Security become taxable that wouldn't have if they waited? So those are topics that a financial planner and a CPA would both have some say in. And when we tell the client that, they start to see where there's some overlap. And overlap, I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, you know, right. if we both chime in on that subject, they'll probably make the best decisions from a financial planning standpoint and a tax standpoint, because both right. are essential to them. So I think by example like that is the best way we, we pique their interest in having us talk to each other. Sure, and ultimately the decision has to be theirs. In other words, they have to feel comfortable with the folks that they're working with and want to engage more than one professional. Beyond that, I wonder to what extent will there be resistance from other professionals. So for example, accountants or CPAs may feel uh, right or wrong that another professional is coming in on their turf and they may feel threatened by that. How would you address a situation like that? I think the place to start that will really help people out is to approach, well, first of all, the, the process is client driven. So if the client is driving it, I feel that uh, I know that that works the best. So, okay. so this isn't like the financial advisor wants to collaborate a little more with the other advisors and I'll ask the client for permission and then go talk to those other advisors. If, if that's your strategy, you, you do see more uh, hurt feelings or people think that you're, you're stepping on their toes. Right. So this is still very important to have the client driving the process and the client might ask the CPA, what would it be helpful for you to know from my estate planning attorney? What would it be helpful for you to know as you do your taxes from my financial person? Is there anything you, you should know about my investments that'll help you do a better job with my taxes? So if you started from a, a standpoint of asking what we can get to them to help them with their job, and then in return when we ask them for something from their standpoint, like even just asking for their advice, what could we help 
the client with to reduce taxes next year, all of a sudden we've started that dialogue where we started by asking for you know, you know, what kind of information they would like from us, and right. then we ask them for a little information that they can now see why it's for the client's benefit. This is all client-centric. So I think that's the answer is you start gently and respecting their authority and asking them for their two cents on the portfolio in some areas where you can see that it'll help the client, then you're starting it off on a better foot than pushing out there, hey, here's what I need right away. So right. start by asking, I think, for, for the help and for how you can help them and then get to what you need. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I like your idea about the fact that it needs to be client-centric because they have to feel the need for that uh, first and foremost. And as a result of that, then we can either work with somebody that they may have a relationship with, such as an accountant or an attorney, uh, or maybe they don't have a relationship with somebody and need an introduction to somebody. Uh, and in those cases, then we need to have, as a financial professional, a relationship with a trusted advisor. In other words, maybe an attorney that we know will handle things in a similar fashion that we would and we would want uh, uh, them to deal with a client in a like manner. Yeah, it's important that when the client is looking for some expertise in an area they don't have already, an estate planning attorney is a good example, someone who hasn't refreshed their will in a long time or maybe they haven't drawn one up, I hate to say that goes on a, an amazing right. number of times out there. So they're looking for someone. What we don't want is the, oh, I can do that professional. And by that I mean someone needs to do an estate plan and they say, oh, I, you know, I think my neighbor's a, an attorney. And so they ask the, the neighbor and they're like, yeah, I'm a litigating attorney you know, in, in Philadelphia, for example. Oh, well, can you do my, my buddy's will? Sure, I, I think I could do that. <laughs> and I've right. seen relationships start that way. Oh, I know the person already. Let's see if we can fit them into this box or this thing that I need. What you have to do is start it the other way, as you were alluding to, is, is okay, I need an estate plan. I need a plan for a, a, a disabled child, and there's some money to take care of that child for the rest of their days. That's a really important topic in our lives. Who is very good at that? Not, mm -hmm. oh, I know an attorney. Could you do this, too, while you're at it? So right. that's what I call the, oh, by the way, you know, oh, sure, I could do that, too. You know, it's, so who would, who would you say are the professionals that a client might want to be aware of that we could work with that would help them solve big picture problems? We mentioned to a tax accountant or a CPA, an estate planning attorney, a uh, financial professional. Who else might fit into that box? Yeah, I think it's very helpful for a client and whichever advisor is helping to organize the team. And there usually will be one lead, by the way. So, and, and I have no pride in ownership. If someone else wants to, to be the lead on a project, that's fine. Clarity of communication is the most important part. Have right. we all described what we're going to do? And my tip, by the way, here is, is everyone should also describe what they're not going to do. Uh, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent, but this is an important lesson we've learned is that if we're going to copy in the CPA on statements, account statements for investments, by the way, that accountant will want to be clear that I'm receiving monthly statements from a tax perspective, but I'm not passing judgment on the quality of the investments or the asset allocation or things like that. The estate attorney, my planning attorney, might be on the loop on things, but again, they want to talk about the areas that they will tackle and the areas that they won't. So I, I think that that's all essential uh, communication that goes on within the group. Mm -hmm. When I, when I think of that, I also um, you know, might include somebody who's an expert at insurance. And insurance is a pretty wide open field because on the one side you have somebody who uh, could very well be a life and health person uh, that may not fall within the uh, discipline of the financial planner. Uh, and then you have property casualty because we all have a need for that. Uh, now that isn't necessarily something that we would uh, help with on a regular basis, but making sure that that's taken care of and that they're in good hands, I think is probably one of the key elements. Absolutely. So when we talk about the team, right, we keep talking about this, the, the three professionals that we think of as, maybe you'll call them the, the core team or it's an ongoing team. But I think one of the, the most important things to share, uh, speaking of collaboration and communication, right. one of the most important things to share between the professionals is the, the scope of the engagement, if you want to call it that. What can we put down in a paragraph or so what we're trying to accomplish for the client? That'll help you identify perhaps who the team leader is, for example. You know, if someone says, well, I, I have a recently disabled child and we want to make sure our assets go to protect that child and we want to take care of some charities when we no longer need the money. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like an estate planning goal, right? right. There are other, lots of things around it, investments and taxes that will play in there, right. but that sounds like the estate planning attorney will be the lead on that. 
Right. Um, so for each client, let's have that description of what the major engagement is, and there will be lots of other stuff around that. And yeah, you're exactly right. Then you'll also list what, maybe you'll call them situational team members, or people will need to consult, like the professionals you mentioned, or maybe they have a business and you need a business valuation, or you right. need to talk about key person insurance, or yeah, the list goes on on, on other experts that we shouldn't forget about that might right. be called in. Um, not permanently. We're not trying to make a team of 20 people either. That starts to overcomplicate things. So right. we're not leaving them out because of uh, any lack of value, but they have a very specific area they're going to chime in on, so we'll keep it efficient by just having them chime in, chime in on that piece that they're experts right. in. But the list could be very long of, of individuals uh, who might be situational in nature that we're going right. to go to when we need to. And as long as we have that all down on a sort of a summary piece of paper, we'll know to do it, and now the group is really communicating. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good answer. Uh, good approach. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and move to our question. Um, completely different topic. Uh, but Drew Nelson in Philadelphia has written in asking, how do I find yield on my investments? Now, of course, we have to be sensitive to the timing of when this show is taped against when it gets aired. But I'm going to just add that we're in a low interest rate environment and that's probably going to remain the case for a while. But how would you answer that question? I wish I had a ton of time because it's, <laughs> an, it's an important question. We get often, don't we, Jim? So, um, and actually, this is a good point to remind the audience of, uh, of our disclaimer, which is simply that you know the information we'll give today is for informational purposes only, right. and the views that we'll all express today are our are, are individual views and not necessarily that of, in my case, Lincoln Investment or any of our broker dealers or firms. So there are opinions today. Right. That being said, yes. where do we find yield in today's environment? Let me point out a couple of things even inherent in that question. So we'll try and keep this to a couple minutes or less, but, it, but it's an interesting area of someone's portfolio that I think sometimes gets neglected a little bit. We all talk about stocks and equities and how I interesting they are. I think that the bond side, the, the yield side of a portfolio is equally important for sure. Um, just like we do in equities, I suggest that people diversify the, the yield or the bond or the fixed income side of their portfolios. And what they should make sure they know about are the three legs of the stool, as I might call it. And okay. so our, our question came in and asked about yield, which is one of the three components. Two major things that will affect yield are liquidity, but, which is when can I get it, my money or my principal, uh, and safety or rating. We know that some mm -hmm. investments are FDIC guaranteed, many are not, and even in yielding or fixed income investments, you can have some that are insured and some that are not. So. As an example, if you're looking at bonds, for example, the further you go out, the higher the yield you normally expect to be paid because your money is locked up longer. At the same time, the lower the quality or the lower the mm -hmm. guarantee on your investment, right. the higher the yield you expect because you have to get paid for that risk. Right. Um, all that being said, so there's the, the quick background on the three components of the, you know, the value or the yield you might expect to get on something. Two strategies I like today on fixed income to get to mo a more direct answer. One okay. is I think that looking at a staggered uh, series of investments can be a very good way to go. CDs are a good example. You could look at bonds to do this as well. But instead of putting all your m money into one investment out there, maybe buying a one-year and a two-year and a three and a four and a five-year bond. We might call that laddering, if, mm -hmm. uh, if our viewers have ever heard of that. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, laddering those bonds out is a really good way to spread out the risk and get a little different yield for those different periods in time. And then if you think about it, if you've constructed something with bonds or CDs that, that start from one year and go all the way out through year five, every year in the future now, every year you have something maturing and giving you your principal back and you get to invest that at the long end of your portfolio now. If you don't need that principal back, you get to invest that money now five more years out. And yet one more year from now, you'll have that that second year bond mature. So that's a nice way to do it. The other component of this is just like we talked about diversifying both sides of the portfolio. Remember that one side of your equities might have some yield to it too. And that is the okay. dividend yielding stocks in your portfolio. You okay. may have some value type stocks. Uh, so again, stocks are certainly not principal guaranteed at all. But if you're going to own equities anyway, you very well may have some good dividend yielding stocks in there that while you wait through the ups and downs of the markets, do put some money in your account while you go. So I think dividend paying stocks and a diversified bond type portfolio should work together. It's not one or the other in any environment, including today. Sounds like a very balanced answer and a very uh, uh, good answer as well. So uh, if you have a question that you would like to send in, uh, for our uh, panel to address. Uh, we'd love to hear from you.
You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. Our guest tonight is Glenn Marshall, President and CEO of First Resource Bank. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. So it's an interesting segue from our uh, question about yield and the banking industry. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to start there. What I'd like to do is uh, uh, give our audience the benefit of understanding uh, first a little bit about your background, okay. uh, maybe touch on first resource as well, and then we can move into bigger picture items sure. as far as the Love industry. To. So, I've uh, been in banking for, for 40 years, um, blessed by meeting a, a really good group of people about 16 years ago. We started talking about uh, forming a bank from scratch. I, I was telling uh, telling Jim a story earlier. The first day we went out and bought a, a printer and uh, some pens because we didn't have anything. So uh, the co-founder of the bank and I um, just started, you know, working our you know what's off uh, 15 years ago, a week ago, um, to put the bank together and uh, and opened it in May of uh, of 05. And we've just been growing the bank organically from that from there. And we have a branch in Nexton and one in Westchester. And we're about three weeks, depending on when this airs, mm -hmm. uh, from having a branch in, in Wayne. So we continue to grow. Um, our model is different than a lot of community banks that you probably and your viewers have sort of experienced over the years. We consider ourselves to be a hybrid community bank. So okay. we want all the high touch. We want you to come in, feel good about coming and seeing the bank. Still for some people, you know, that's a little bit of a, an experience. They want to come in and, and talk to the teller. Um, but we get 61% uh, of our deposits every day electronically. So we don't need to be on every street corner so we can be the best of a, of a high touch community bank and all the technology. So that's really been the model that we've been working on. We we didn't stumble across it, but about 12 years ago, we thought this is where community banks are going. Uh, there's going to be significantly less need for branches, and technology is just going to, you know, kind of be be the day. And 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 I think it was the right decision. Um, you see what's going on right now with a lot of the fintechs, and uh, but they lose that high touch um, that I think people want. They still want to be able to go see a banker and talk to a banker. So it sounds like first resource has been able to find a sweet spot to complement the larger, bigger names that we see out there. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, you have to remember in this country, and I say 40 years of banking, and hopefully I look younger than that, but, you know, there used to be 18,000 banks in this country. Now we're down to five. So as things have rolled up, we refer to a lot of those folks as the disenfranchised of community banking. They're, they're really looking for as much as they want to be able to do it on their phone and do it with an app and get online and have all the mobile banking and, and make that deposit with their check. There are matters that they need to talk to a person, not an 800 number, not an app, you know, not a, an online chat. I mean, we, we have circumstances, uh, not every day, thank, thank heavens, but you know, we had one last week where I mean, the guy's account got hacked through his payroll company and we had four people spend the entire day on his situation, which you're just not going to get in a larger bank situation, you're going to get an uh, uh, you're going to an 800 number, and you're just going to be pulling your hair out for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we we think that experience is is one of the things that really separates us from um, a lot of our peers, but then also obviously the the larger regional banks and the, the national players. You know, Glenn, before the show, we had a chance to talk mm -hmm. a little bit, and you were getting, I don't know if you could tell, you were getting a little excited about some of the other ways that your bank and, and community banks are involved in the community. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, how else do you see a, a smaller bank being able to be part of the local yeah. culture? Uh, you know, listen, it, it, the larger the bank, the more they support national um, things. Um, the beauty of a community bank is, and especially, you know, our, the the... The, the people that run our bank, and we're passionate about certain charities and things like that. We get to support them. You know, there's a program in the state, EITC, which is a tax credit, which is 
where we can take uh, monies that we would spend in taxes and get a credit, but use it in our community for education purposes. Um, we're into every one of those. We're, we're sponsoring, uh, I said to you before, we have a piggy bank, we'll put money in the piggy bank and let them use it as, as a live auction item. It might be as small as a couple hundred bucks, to, to a much you know, larger contribution to some event. But every one of those is important. Every one of those charities touches a group of people and, and their cause, and, and we, we support a ton of those. If we do a shredded event at the bank that's free, we always have a charity there that gets to promote their charity, but then we'll also auction off a, a pig and they'll be able to collect some money. We had a, the Chester County Food Bank came in and they collected food and uh, a group called Pals for Life and they had some of their their, um, their animals that are there for therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool because everybody gets to be engaged and, and if you know all the, we try to support everything that the employees are passionate about mm -hmm. and then the, what the customer base gets passionate about, we're, we're just as passionate about it at the bank. Do you find a cross section of age group of um, uh, customers that, that are uh, loyal to the bank? You, you know, know? It, it is pretty universal because even I think the younger folks um, we do mostly commercial, um, so if we're doing a, we maybe somebody that's getting into doing real estate and they're they're buying some rehabbing properties, you know they want that consultant, they want that person to kind of help them get to where they see someone that's maybe a generation above them and has you know 100 properties and they're like I want to be that person, right. and you know that consulting we can help them get there because we've you know we're doing a lot of that. So I don't know that it's generational. As much as, as the literature, the popular literature says that, that this age group or the X or millennials like this or don't like that, we really haven't found that. We, we, we find that we, we do well with a, a, a someone who is very entrepreneurial and wants to have somebody stand by them and help them get to where they want to be. And that's on the banking side, for us the commercial side, you know, that's what the, sort of a hallmark of community banking, helping your customers you know, get to their goals. I mean, you guys do that too, right. just in a different way. You just mentioned something I was going to ask you about because I noticed you lit up as well earlier when you told the story of starting the bank from scratch and your first pens and yeah. printer <laughs> purchase, right? Yeah. You got excited about that too. Yeah. Do you think that that helps you relate to some of your customers? Because a lot of, in, in the communities that you're in, which I'm familiar mm -hmm. with, uh, there I would think that a lot of your customers are those local entrepreneurs starting up businesses or growing businesses that they already have. Don't you feel a, a little extra connection? Are, are you rooting? Yeah. I, I almost feel you're rooting uh, for that. No, right? absolutely. <laughs> you know, we, like, we can relate to them because uh, Lauren Rinelli, who's the co-founder of the bank, we literally got up every day trying to figure out how to, you know, how to protect our shareholders, how to make money, how to have the, the employee um, base. It's, it's no different than every one of our customers. I mean, they're, they're the mo they're, starting a bank is the most entrepreneurial thing you can do as a banker. It's hard to relate when you're talking to somebody who's, oh, I work for, I'm not going to pick them, some large bank, right? And you're like, yeah, you get that, but you just don't, you don't get this. I mean, we, um, yeah, it's, it is crazy. It, it is absolutely crazy. Unless you've done it, which very few of us have done it, mm -hmm. um, it's really, really hard to relate to. But it's really great when you're talking to, you know, a, a prospect or somebody who want to come to the bank and go, I understand what you do. Every morning you get up, you walk through the office, and you see 15 people that are solely dependent on you making smart decisions you know, for their livelihood. And it's the same thing with, with, with the bank. We Now we're going to be 50 employees here, well, either like the next one we hire, I think, or the last one we just hired. It's hard mm -hmm. to keep track of sometimes. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. It really gets you charged up and gets you out of bed in the morning, that's for sure. Should I be the peacemaker here since we're that's in a, this banking center that is Philadelphia? <laughs> Not trying to put down any of the big banks, by the way. What we're trying to do today is to delve into the community bank and find out where you do shine, because every institution oh, shines yeah. in their own way. So just to be clear to all of our, our uh, audience yeah, members we're, who are we, part we, of that, we, uh, they're both different mm -hmm. for, for different purposes, and that's, so that's what we're diving into today with you. And I want to ask from that, where are you going in the future? Where do you see your bank headed? Or is it to become a, a large national bank? Uh, you know, we, we want to scale what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So when we look at how we do it and who we do it for, we want to scale it as far as it'll go. And, you know, if we get to the point, and we, we use this line all the time, we don't want to be every other bank. We don't want to get to the point that we lose that, that focus. And we, when we started the bank, we literally had a page, of, and we wrote a bunch of rules down for ourselves. And, you know, I, I, not, I, I knock on wood, um, we have not, ever done anything that's not, like we haven't violated any of those rules. 
Um, so that's, we've really stuck to what we want to do. We really stuck to the original premise to support entrepreneurs, to have a, a bank that literally always does the right thing. And we haven't ever gotten away from that. And if we have, someone's in a quiet meeting, you go, that's not us. And we go, yeah, you're right, it's not us. So as long as we can scale that, there's really no limit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope it's a refreshing break from, you know, when you came out of the Great Recession, people were like, oh, you're a banker. Like, it was a bad <laughs> word. When, yeah. for all the years before that, it was never a bad word. It was entrenched in the community. It was a good thing. You know, there were a lot, kind of a place of honor at some point, you know, at one right. point in the community. And I don't know how it got to be not viewed that way because a really good community bank is going to make its community better. Well, I have a short answer for that. It's okay. called the media and the financial <laughs> press, which I don't find terribly uh, reliable in many respects. And I've said that for years and years in our industry, but let's not open that yeah. door yeah. just I, yet. I agree. <laughs> Going into the future, as Michael was alluding mm -hmm. to, <laughs> do you see bigger banks actually getting attracted to the community bank and wanting to... Uh, buy a company like yours but maintain that community presence and can they do that no they, they it's it's um my only good example is is that when general motors wanted to start saturn that's what they wanted to do and then they just couldn't keep from messing with it and then they screwed it up <laughs> so i don't think that's possible for them to do that although i think that um, in the layer that's the large bank i think that that layer wants to have a few more branches and be more um, out gathering deposits locally as a, opposed to relying on over, like overnight money in the national, international market. So I think you'll see some of the larger players open some more branches. But you know, you're, you're getting this rift where banks are really either big or there's this layer that's, that's the community bank, say, below a billion. And the divide between them is, is getting wider, not narrower. I mean, you're either really big or you're under a billion. And I think that'll continue. I think it'll get worse. So where you won't be able to find a, you know, a local, you know, you, you see the merger with uh, Beneficial and Wisfis, which probably on paper looks good, but you're, you're taking two people and now you're making them a big, you know, you're making them a, a much bigger player. Well, they have, to, they have to adhere to what's going on in the market. I mean, they, they're going to be on investor calls. Guys like you are going to be asking them questions about little efficiency things, and they're going to then have to take that much shorter view of life. And we've tried to continue to take that longer view of life and kind of do the right thing over a long period of time and, and not get hung up in you know month-to-month, -month, quarter to quarter kind of things and build the bank and build it out and, and make it more scalable. So just in clarification, WISFIS is short for WSFS, Thank you. correct? Yes. So. Yes. Uh, thank you, Glenn. That was very informative. And um, yeah, we could keep this conversation going as mm -hmm. uh, it certainly sounds like there will be absolutely a place for uh, different size banks going forward. So yeah, thank you for your insight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Hopefully you picked up a few nuggets along the way. Uh, be sure to tune in to our next show. Uh, Chris Carr, who is the president and CEO of a company called Ferrotech, spelled F-A-R-O-T-E-C-H, Ferrotech. They are a digital marketing agency specializing in web design. And until then, remember, your money matters. <laughs>